Well, good morning. Thank you for uh, showing up on a Sunday morning on Father's Day. So happy Father's Day to the fathers or anyone who had a father. Um, I want to thank uh, Prescott for giving me this opportunity to uh, talk about something I've thought about for a lot of years. And unlike most talks, I'm not really going to talk about my research very much. Uh, I'm going to talk in general about what stress is about. And there'll really be two parts to the talk. Oh, I was going to introduce a little bit of what I have worked on. Um, I've worked on what's good about having a stress response. You know, most people tend to work on what goes wrong when you're chronically stressed. I've worked on what's good about a stress response when it's happening. How does it help us survive to adapt? Looked at mechanisms of stress hormone action, uh, context dependency of the stress response. And my interests have ranged from field studies, which is where I started, through biomedical um, research at the bench, to trying to bring together people to see how field studies and, and uh, clinical studies might work together. And one of my operating principles has been um, defined by August Crow, a Danish physiologist. Uh, in the early 20th century. And essentially what he said is, for every problem in biology, there's an ideal organism to study that. And so I have studied stress uh, over the last 25 years in a number of different organisms because we can ask different questions. And what's nice is getting the ability to pull them all together in an integrated view. So there are really two parts to the talk. Uh, first part might be something like a, an intro biology course, talking about what is stress, the neuroendocrine components of, of stress, activation of the HPA axis that we'll talk about a lot, the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. And we'll talk about trying to define stress, which is a very difficult uh, thing. The second part is to try to put stress in context. But what I mean is that stress hormone action and our responses to stressors vary a lot. And they vary with a number of things, individual differences, species differences, predictability or controllability, cellular context, so the neuroendocrine history that cells have experienced before they see stress hormones, a little bit about a new field of epigenetics, the effects uh, of stress on uh, modifications of the genome uh, in response to stress or in, in uh, changing our lifetime stress responses, and a little bit about stressors, uh, sorry, anti-stressors. And here I need to uh, introduce Lily. Lily is our older dog. She's uh, a 10-year-old Australian Shepherd. Okay, so part of the title of the talk is Stress a, Head is stress a Headache. Is stress a headache? It's probably the first thing we think of. Sure, stress is a headache. It also produces a lot of other annoyances, stress-related annoyances, upset stomachs, aches and pains, things like that, insomnia, but I recognize that one. Some people get chest pain or rapid heartbeats, and some people have frequent colds when they're stressed a lot. All right, so stress, can be a headache. We're very familiar with that, with that concept. Can stress be more than a headache? More than a bellyache? I'm going to get to this figure in just a second. And the answer is yes, that chronic severe stress may cause or worsen a number of conditions. And some very important ones are um, effects that stress has on mental health problems. So depression and anxiety are very closely related to stress. PTSD, of course, is um, a response to extreme stress. Cardiovascular disease and another, uh, a number of other conditions like arthritis and asthma. So I wanted to just spend uh, a minute talking about a scary study. This was done uh, by Robert Sapolsky a number of years ago. He did a lot of field research in Africa. Uh, and in this study, 
uh, he had access to some vervet monkeys that had been subjected to very extreme conditions before they died. They were very crowded. There was a tremendous amount of uh, social uh, interaction that was um, not good. Uh, these animals uh, suffered all sorts of physical symptoms. And when he got their brains to do a necropsy, he, uh, saw, whoops, he saw something very interesting. Oh, no pointers. Uh, on the top is an image of cells from the vervet monkey hippocampus, a region that you'll hear a lot about with Cheryl Conrad. Uh, it's involved in learning and memory. And here we see a, a nice uh, accumulation of cells in the region of the hippocampus we see on the bottom, uh, in the bottom of that uh, top image. In the bottom image, we have the neuroanatomy of these stressed, terribly stressed uh, monkeys, and the cells are nearly absent. All right, so this scared a lot of people. It turns out it's an extremely rare event because uh, typically no one or no organisms are, are subjected to these types of stressors. It was an artificial situation. But that's a scary response to lose the neurons in your hippocampus. All right, so stress is an issue. It's a public health issue. Uh, it's been estimated, and th these data are old. These are from 2002. It's been estimated that stress-related illnesses cost us, just the United States, uh, about $100 billion annually. Right, so stress is relevant for any sort of research with animals. It's certainly relevant uh, thinking, when thinking about ourselves and each other. All right, so let's start to talk more specifically about what's going on uh, with stress. So these uh, illustrate a number of uh, factors that might cause us to feel stressed. But the question is, do these problems make us sick? Does debt make us sick? No, debt doesn't make us sick. It's our physiological responses to these adverse conditions that can cause us to get sick. All right, and so we want to understand what it is about these physiological responses uh, that can make us sick, and I also want to at least touch upon why it's necessary to have these responses. All right, so we, ha we have responses that can make us sick, and yet every vertebrate has the same responses. The stress response, has been highly conserved throughout vertebrate evolution. So a fish on a hook, student taking an exam, I use this example in classes a lot, are having the same stress response. And we'll see what this is. And there are implications to viewing this from an evolutionary perspective. Right, so get out of the clinical world and think about why we have a stress response that has been highly conserved in every vertebrate species. So why is that? Well, you might have guessed there are some very good reasons to have a stress response. All right, so it's time to do some, some terminology. What is stress? Anybody want to give me? I mean, we all know what stress is, right? Anybody want to give me a definition? I didn't think so. This is what I get in class. <laughs> right, what is stress? Well, it's a terrible term. It was first used by the father of stress physiology, uh, Hans Selye, in the mid 20th century. So in the 19th century, people weren't stressed. It'd be nice to know that. This is a new phenomenon, using the term stress, which was a term from physics, to use that applied to physiology, and it created all sorts of problems because stress itself doesn't say whether we're talking about a stimulus or a response or a process. 
And so it's helpful to um, take a look at uh, some better ways to define stress. Too bad I can't make this click. I, this is uh, got the sound of breaking glass with it, and I could torment you by clicking on this repeatedly until someone gave me an answer to what is stress. All right, but we, we could say that a stressor is the stimulus. A stressor is a perceived threat to homeostasis. Now, we'll see in a second that using another big word like homeostasis presents its own problems. But it's good to have a stimulus. And then we have a response, which we can call a stress response. And the stress response is some sort of attempt to restore homeostasis, if we follow these textbook definitions of stress. Right, so there are, uh, and, and the stress response does always involve the release of stress hormones. Uh, it's this highly conserved um, physiological response leading to the release of stress hormones. Okay, so we've got to deal with this concept of homeostasis now, which is actually very controversial in physiology. But we could say uh, it was developed by uh, Cannon uh, in um, a very nice sort of approach to thinking about how organisms maintain their internal balance, some sort of stability. So homeostasis is a property of living organisms to regulate their internal environment in order to maintain stability. Okay, so we're subjected to all sorts of influences, internal, external, but it's very important for us to maintain certain physiological variables within a narrow range. So blood pH is one of those that's very critical. We can't tolerate changes in blood pH. So understanding homeostasis in relation to blood pH is very straightforward. Right when our blood pH drops, becomes acidic, we increase our breathing, gets rid of carbon dioxide, and that increases our blood pH, returns it to uh, a normal level. This is a great example of uh, physiological reflex. Okay? So how would it work? Some sort of stressor, in this case we have a psychological stressor. It's somehow perceived by the brain and that information is processed and that leads to the stress response. Right? The stress response usually involves activation of the sympathetic nervous system. You know that maybe as the fight or flight response, and that helps to produce physiological and, importantly, behavioral responses to help survive this threat that was perceived. But the real hallmark of the stress response is activation of the HPA axis, the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. So the H in there is the hypothalamus. A lot of information is processed leading the hypothalamus to release a neuropeptide, we can just call it CRH. CRH then acts on the anterior pituitary gland and causes the anterior pituitary to release another hormone called ACTH. We can leave it with its abbreviation. ACTH travels through the bloodstream and acts on the adrenal gland and causes the adrenal gland to release either cortisol or corticosterone. So humans have cortisol, dogs have cortisol, fish have cortisol. Amphibians, reptiles, birds, and a lot of mammals release corticosterone. Functionally, they're equivalent. And so I sometimes just abbreviate this CORT, C-O-R-T. All right, this is a neuroendocrine cascade, absolutely conserved in vertebrate evolution and critical for surviving threats. All right, when we talk about threats, it's amazing. 
It's amazing what happens with the stress response. An incredible number of threats. Oh my gosh, Hans Selye started by injecting formalin into rats and so stress responses. But injury, like this uh, girl on my daughter's soccer team who injured her knee, or cold. This was our trip to Ecuador. We were at 14,000 feet in the Andes. It was cold. These are going to release cortisol, activate the HPA axis, and any number of other threats to, we can talk about homeostasis here maybe, um, will lead to activation of the HPA axis. So heat is one, dehydration is one, you name it, a lot of physiological uh, uh, conditions will activate the stress response. And in addition to that, the body mounts other responses that might be specific to uh, specific threats, like uh, stress response in, uh, the stress response is activated uh, in response to hemorrhage. There'll be other uh, processes that occur to stop the bleeding. So they work together. And as I mentioned, um, this stress response is nearly identical in all vertebrates. Now, I keep harping on this because something, uh, you know, we could uh, pretty much conclude that something that's so highly conserved in vertebrate evolution is there for a good reason. Okay, so dogs have the same HPA axis. What's wrong with this picture? HPA axis. I see the P, I see the A. Uh, common mistake, they forgot the hypothalamus in that picture. So the hypothalamus is the master gland here. The hypothalamus is regulating this, uh, a lot of the endocrine system, but in this case, we're, it, it is responsible for driving the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. All right, so what happens during a stress response? These are data, um, sort of iconic at this point, uh, from Sprague Dolly rats, lab rats. These rats were put into restrainers. There's nothing painful about it. They don't like it. They can't get out. And they very quickly mount a stress response. So if you look at their corticosterone levels for rats, cort levels, they go up very rapidly. Uh, really peak around 30 minutes, and then they start to come down again. So this is another important component of the HPA axis. We have powerful negative feedback mechanisms that bring the cortisol or corticosterone levels back to our basal range very quickly. And we start to get problems when negative feedback mechanisms can't work. So we want a nice, big, healthy stress response, and then we want to bring it down when we've dealt with the threat. OK, it's good to remember, especially those who are doing research on stress, that there's also a daily rhythm of corticosterone or cortisol release. And this daily rhythm uh, is such that levels peak just before the onset of activity. So if we're diurnal, they peak just before we wake up in the morning. If you're uh, a nocturnal animal, they will peak at the end of the day just before uh, the evening activities. All right, so people doing stress studies or thinking about them have to remember that on top of a stress response or below a stress response, there's always this diurnal rhythm. Now, one interpretation of this is that waking up in the morning is stressful, and I think my daughter would agree with that, so we could conclude that she's having a stress response every morning. All right, this poor guy, who's my son, who's now going off to college, he was a very good chess player. When he was young, he was a fabulous chess player. 
uh, was in lots of competitions, uh, national competition. He placed very high in England. We were there on sabbatical. But he found playing chess to be very stressful. He'd get a bellyache. His heart would race. He just dreaded going to these tournaments right before the tournament. And he was having, I can guarantee, a robust stress response. What's the problem here? Where's the threat to homeostasis? How can a chess game threaten his homeostasis? How is this chess game going to th throw off his sodium concentration? This is where we, uh, I have to conclude at least, that we need a different definition of stress, or at least a definition of stressors and stress responses. And if we take this more evolutionary perspective, I think there's a way out. All right, so in some cases, a stressor is very straightforward, uh, a perceived threat to survival, a perceived threat to homeostasis. That does work. But let's call it something other than homeostasis, because that term is ambiguous. Survival is not ambiguous. All right, so that's one component of a stressor. But this is not relevant to my son playing in a chess tournament. In a very broad sense, I think we can also say that stressors are threats to survival, and our threats to reproduction. That would be a definition of fitness uh, in evolutionary terms, a Darwinian fitness. What is your survival and reproduction? OK, and now if you think about it, stress starts to make a little bit more sense, the idea of stressors. And I have, I, I have to say that I owe this insight to a student. So I challenged my class to tell me, how is it that taking an exam leads to such a stress response? How is it even related to reproduction? And she said, well, if you do poorly on the exam, then you're not going to get the mate you want. You're not going to reproduce in the way you wanted to. And so you have to think about this in a very broad sense. Perhaps my son was not so much concerned with reproduction at his age, but is this a threat to his family, a threat to his community, his sense of belonging, which implies some sort of threat to reproduction, long-term success. All right, so this is a definition of stressors that, that I have adopted. I haven't seen it in the textbooks yet. And then a stress response is a physiological, behavioral response to these threats, threats to survival or reproduction. All right, so what does cortisol do during a stress response? This is. Uh, the famous metaphor that uh, Robert Sapolsky developed to explain what goes on during a stress response. What happens to a zebra and a lion on the savanna? When you're going to get a potent release, both animals, uh, a potent activation of the HPA axis and the release of cortisol. So what is cortisol doing during a stress response? And it's actually not that easy a question to answer because we have receptors, molecules in our cells that respond to cortisol everywhere. So our whole body is geared to respond to stress hormones. But what's going on? In general, I think what's going on is that cortisol, corticosterone, are directing resources energy or mental resources um, 
towards dealing with a threat. And in a way, waking up in the morning is similar. The morning we wake up, we have to gear it up for activity and alertness. And I think that's related to what corticosteroids do in general in redirecting resources. The most well-known aspect of corticosterone action is an increase in glucose in the bloodstream. All right, so why would an increase in glucose in the bloodstream be helpful? Come on, somebody can give me. Energy, right. Glucose is a fuel. We use it to generate ATP. This zebra needs to get some energy to escape that lion. The lion needs energy to catch the zebra. All right, then. And we actually call corticosterone and, and uh, cortisol glucocorticoids uh, because of this, because of their role in increasing glucose. A lot of other more complex things. Corticosterone, cortisol increase sympathetic responses within our cells. So there's an interaction there. And in general, they tend to decrease non-essential functions. Decrease functions that are not essential to surviving this threat. Decrease behaviors, ongoing behaviors like grazing. Shut that off and start running. So increase stress-related behaviors, increase alertness, increase in certain types of memory, those associated with stressors. I think Cheryl Conrad's gonna talk about some of that today. And we also get cortisol providing that negative feedback. So as soon as it's released, uh, we start to see negative feedback mechanisms try to keep this response under control so that we don't get the deleterious outcomes. Okay, energy, redirecting energy, redirecting behavior towards dealing with a threat. In general, that's what corticosterone, cortisol do during a stress response. All right, so that's great. Without it, you may not survive. This is where it's important to remember, absolutely conserved invertebrate evolution. Without this response, you may not survive, or your survival, your reproduction will be limited. Your behavior will be less than optimal. You know, in the field, it doesn't have to be that you become incapacitated, but just behavior, physiology that's just not quite optimal can lead to a predator getting you. All right, so an increase in blood glucose, that makes good sense. We wanna deal with this threat. Increase in cardiac output, the amount of blood that the, car, that the heart is pumping. Yeah, deliver oxygen to muscles, deliver fuel. Changes in brain activity so that they're directed towards the stressor, an increase in vigilance. This makes good sense. And then these non-essential functions, digestion, reproduction, growth. Right? The zebra running from the lion, this is not the time to think about the next meal, having babies. Those resources will be directed elsewhere. Complex effects uh, in the short term uh, on immune responses and inflammation. So these are all critical for surviving threats, or at least some combination of them depending on the stressor. All right, so what are the possible consequences of chronic stressors or some dysregulation of the HPA axis, some extreme conditions? What sort of outcome do we get 
if there's a chronic elevation of blood glucose. Diabetes, absolutely. Absolutely. My wife's cat, Boris, for some reason got extremely stiff, almost unable to move. Severe inflammation. He was put on high doses of corticosteroids, cortisol-like molecules, and magically, he was able to move again. He was like the young Boris all over again. And then he died. He got diabetes from that chronic elevation of blood glucose. Okay, so we don't want a prolonged stress response that's gonna increase our blood glucose long term. We also get muscle wasting from that. How about increased cardiac output, increased working of the heart? Hypertension, heart attacks. We don't want that long term. Brain activity, changes in brain activity, vigilance could present itself as cognitive deficits, which you may hear about. Anxiety, depression, very closely linked. Neuroanatomical changes in the structure of dendrites, for example, that you'll hear about. Shut down the digestive system is partly associated with ulceration, and ovulation, dwarfism. These are all stress-related conditions and less resistance to disease. Okay, so here's this response that's critical for survival. And if we can't shut that off, for whatever reason, these are some of the potential outcomes. Okay, so that's the end of uh, the first part of the talk, my, uh, my course in introduction to the stress response. The rest of the time I wanna talk about context specificity because I think this provides some real insights into what's going on uh, in response to stress. Not every organism has deleterious effects to stressors, depending on the condition. So let's take a look at some of these things. I wanna start with some data looking at individual, actually species differences in response, uh, in responsiveness to stressors. Okay, so a lot of studies have shown that uh, in birds that are breeding in temperate regions um, respond to bad weather, a big storm, a snowstorm, uh, unexpectedly, a drop in temperature, rain. They will abandon their nest. They'll have a huge corticosterone response. The corticosterone actually stimulates their locomotor behavior to get them uh, abandoning the nest. But this was a... Um, a study done by Michael Romero and John Wingfield, they were looking at Arctic breeders. And this is data from one species, these Lapland lung spurs. And they, they used a number of uh, measures of bad weather. I thought the temperature made the case pretty, uh, pretty clearly. So looking at the increase in corticosterone in response to bad weather, in this case, temperature, and we don't need to worry about the stress-induced changes. That's their particular area of research. But look at the baseline levels of, stress, of uh, corticosterone, regardless of the temperature. That's a huge range of temperature. And this species, it does not produce a stress response. In animals living in California, for example, or Washington, where they breed there in moderate conditions in the summer, that would produce a large stress response. All right, this is context dependency. Some birds live in the Arctic, some birds live, or some birds live in the, uh, breed in the Arctic, some birds breed in more temperate climates. So what's the difference in their stress response. Why does one group have a stress response whereas these Arctic birds don't? 
How do they view this situation differently, physiologically? Well, I'd say it's predictability. For birds living in the Arctic, it's very predictable for them that there's going to be this bad weather. For the temperate breeding birds, bad weather is an unexpected event. Right? So it's the same potential stressor, cold. In one species, it's a stressor. In another species, it's not. All right, predictability. It can make sense. All right, but there are some highly stressful events that are highly predictable. So there have to be other types of triggers, other characteristics of stressors. So one might think of the death of a parent from old age. This is, there's nothing more predictable than this. And yet few events in life are more stressful. All right, so we want to think about why do these, why does this um, experience stressful when it is very predictable? And I think the answer here is controllability, which is something you'll hear more about. Uncontrollable events, even if they're predictable, uncontrollable events or stressors produce a greater stress response and more negative outcomes than controllable ones. All right, so I want to show some data on this. These are some uh, beautiful uh, data from way back in 1983, uh, Steve Mara's lab. I think you'll see some more of this. This is uh, one of the initial studies. So this is a setup where you put rats in cages, wire cages, and the cages are hooked up to a shock generator. It's not uh, enough to uh, hurt the rats, but it's not pleasant. And they would like to avoid it. Uh, if they can't avoid it, they'll produce a big stress response. Right, but in this setup, these two cages are yoked to each other. So these two animals are going to re receive the same amount of shock. One group, though, the escapable shock, if they turn that wheel, that shuts off the shock. Shuts it off for that animal, shuts it off for the animal that can't escape. Same stressor, shock, different outcomes. And in this case, this study was looking at immune outcomes. This was really the birth of this field of looking at the effects of uh, stress on immune function, uh, psychoneuroimmunology. So here in this study, they looked at the stimulation of lymphocytes, mounting a good immune response, um, in animals that had uh, the ability to escape and those that did not have the ability to escape. So for those that could control the shock, they produced a very nice stimulation of lymphocytes. For those that could not control the shock, same shock, their immune system was blunted. That's pretty interesting, right? And it's similar in terms of context. In the previous study, same cold, potentially, different responses. That was related to predictability. This is related to controllability. All right, I want to do a little bit a look at cellular context. And these were some studies I was involved in, uh, looking at, at rough skin newts. And what we're going to look at here is how experience, context, neuroendocrine history alters the responses to stress hormones. All right, so a brief background. Uh, these rough skin newts uh, display this uh, ma uh, male courtship clasping behavior if they're stressed acutely or if they get a, a, an injection of corticosterone, they quickly stop clasping. Right on the other side, the neuropeptide arginine vasotocin stimulates the male clasping behavior. All right, that's pretty straightforward. All right, but 
let's look at context. So in this experiment that, that Jim Rose did, um, what we see is that corticosterone very acutely, so during a stress response, not hours later, um, changes the sensory processing of um, uh, hindbrain neurons in response to pressure applied to the cloaca. The cloaca is, uh, birds have cloaca, amphibians, reptiles have a cloaca. It's a common um, organ for uh, release of wastes and um, reproductive uh, function. So if you apply pressure to the cloaca during the breeding season, you could see that these neurons start to fire. And that's associated with clasping. But if you give the animals an injection of corticosterone, then apply the cloacal pressure, it's during the breeding season, they no longer produce this electrophysiological response. This clasp stimulating stimulus, which mimics the presence of the female, no longer causes the male to clasp. All right, that makes sense. If there's an immediate threat, a stressor, this maybe isn't the best time to be clasping and courting, and maybe it's time to think about escape. All right, so a robust difference in the responsiveness. Interestingly, if you apply pressure to the snout, there's the same response. So the corticosterone does not produce a change in responsiveness to pressure on the snout but it does to this cloacal pressure. All right, so looking at vasotocin, before vasotocin, we have um, applied cloacal pressure. These are our responses. After this stimulating uh, neuropeptide, applied cloacal pressure, you get greater responsiveness, increase the likelihood of clasping. But if you give vasotocin and corticosterone after the animal has started clasping, it seems kind of paradoxical. You get a further increase in responsiveness. Right? So instead of inhibiting the, the, the firing of these hindbrain neurons, corticosterone is now enhancing it because the context has changed. Right? So you want to compare that to this was the effect of corticosterone alone, and this is its effect after. This, the hindbrain neurons have seen um, vasopressin, vasotocin, sorry. All right, so it's easy to assume that corticosterone is always anti-reproductive, but that's not necessarily the case. It depends on context. The response to corticosterone depends on neuroendocrine context. This is an area I've been particularly interested in. All right, shortly, uh, briefly, I want to go into uh, another exciting new area, um, and that's the effect of experience on epigenetics. All right, so most vertebrates are, are highly resilient in the face of stressors. This is Misha, our new puppy. But not always. All right, so a study uh, that we looked at uh, in one of my classes showed that when children are subjected to poverty, and they have to be within a window of like 9 to 11 years old, poverty and stress. This was pretty extreme poverty up in the Appalachian uh, region. Uh, as adults, these children, no longer children, as adults, the children that were subjected to these extreme circumstances show different processing of stressful stimuli as adults, a different emotional regulation in adulthood. Well, we didn't talk about the, medi the medial prefrontal cortex, but um, that's the last region to develop in humans. This is why teenagers have no good sense. The, the prefrontal cortex is not developed until the 20s. So in this case, what we see in the, the, the people that were subjected to this extreme stressors is that 
the medial prefrontal cortex is not acting as one would expect. All right, so how does this occur? We don't really know, but here's a suggestion, a paper from Michael Meany's group that's been very exciting, epigenetic modification of brain function. So epigenetics, epigenetic modifications has to do with changes in the behavior of genes that are lifelong. It's not a mutation of the gene, it's not evolution. The gene is not destroyed in any way. But there's a biochemical modification of that gene. Often it's a, a methylation, adding a, a methyl group. The details don't matter, but in this study, what they looked at was the amount of methylation of, amazingly enough, the court receptor gene. And what they saw is that rats that were born to low care mothers and were reared by low care mothers have a lot of methylation. That means there's gonna be very little expression of the uh, corticosteroid receptor gene as adults. If they were born to high care mothers, then there's very little methylation. If they cross foster them, what you see is it doesn't matter what the birth mother is, it, what matters is the experience. So if, an, if these rats are reared in a high care environment, high care, they show low, uh, ex, low methylation of this glucocorticoid gene, glucocorticoid receptor gene. And what uh, their conclusion is, is there's less negative feedback when there are fewer um, genes expressed in the brain. Okay, so this is an enduring effect. So is stress a killer? Yes, no. There are some anti-stressors. Stress can definitely make you sick or hasten death. I mean, we looked at some of those data. But a recent study showed that, in a big epidemiological study, that those that reported uh, in these questionnaires a lot of stress died. They died uh, at a greater rate, except that was only among those who perceived that stress affected their health a lot. The questionnaires were able to pull this out. If they didn't think that stress affected their health, they did not die at any higher rate. And a similar study showed that stress does increase mortality, except it doesn't produce any greater mortality, maybe even the opposite, if people were giving care to others. Now, these are pretty profound studies. I was actually turned on to them by a TED talk that Kelly McGonigal uh, has. Uh, I suggest you take a look at it. She's a lot more poetic and uh, uh, not quite as skeptical as I am about some of the data, but this is a great talk. All right, so uh, the, what we think is involved is the hormone oxytocin. Oxytocin is my favorite hormone. It enhances bonding, uh, it enhances trust, and there's a reciprocal relationship between being involved in others and the likelihood of being involved, and it's mediated by oxytocin. And an interesting thing is that in some stressful situations, a lot of them, oxytocin is released. This potentially anti-stress hormone. If you're going to increase your bonding uh, with others, you'll experience stress differently. Maybe this is a natural antidote to stress. And I wanted to get just touch on these recent studies. The gaze of a dog can increase oxytocin levels in its human. So a very recent paper actually concludes that the evolution of bonds between humans and dogs was mediated by oxytocin. That the gaze of the dog and the human, the reciprocal gaze, increases oxytocin in both the human and the dog. 
increase the bonding. And what I'd like to think is that there are implications of this for stress research. So not only is the act of giving and bonding with others perhaps an antidote to stress, but maybe interacting with your dog is. OK, so I just, uh, our take home points are from the outline, the stress response is highly conserved, plays a critical role in survival and reproduction, uh, defining stressors in that, in that way as a threat to survival or reproduction. It's a new way of thinking about it, which I think uh, is helpful. And then we went through a few examples of how stressors produce context-specific effects and the importance of thinking about context when you're thinking about stress. And so some other anti-stressors for me, the people in my lab, we didn't really present any of our current uh, data, but uh, the bonding that occurs with uh, students is maybe not as powerful as the bonding with family, but um, when they're not stressing me, they're anti-stressors. So that's, uh, that's what I have to say to you today, so thank you.